but I feel like people aren't listening to women. Like they're, they're not seeing women as at risk, despite the fact that we've been, you know, you and I and many others have been like telling people women are more likely to die from heart disease. They're more likely to have a heart attack than these other causes, especially when they have a lot of risk factors. Welcome everyone to the inaugural uh, podcast series for the European Cardiology Review with Radcliffe. Um, I am Dr. Martha Galati. I was the former chief of cardiology at University of Arizona. I'm the president elect of the American Society for Preventive Cardiology. And I have the honor today of being with my close friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Aaron Mikos, who's joining me from John Hopkins University today. And we are going to discuss our upcoming uh, journal review that is all about women or sex differences um, in cardiovascular disease, which you can access online. But we thought today we would have the opportunity to highlight some of the things that we wrote about and um, some of the differences that we just want to talk about. So thank you, Erin, for agreeing to join me today. Thank you for having me on the podcast. And also I was grateful to um, be invited to submit a contribution to this special issue. Um, my article was about secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease in women. And I had the pleasure to co-write this with Dr. Arti Takar, who is an internal medicine resident at Johns Hopkins applying to cardiology and Dr. Andita Agarwal Kulkarni, who is directing the prevention program at Baylor Scott and White Health Heart Hospital in Baylor, Plano, Texas. Awesome. Well, it, it, thank you for doing it and taking it on and doing all the great mentorship you do with so many people. I was the one of the co-editors of this entire series with Dr. Angela Moss, who I actually wish she joined us, but <laughs> she really wanted us to talk. So um, let's get talking about some of the things that you all wrote about. Um, you, you talked about the secondary prevention, but let's start with some of the things and let's, let's focus on coronary artery disease as, as your paper did as well. I mean, obviously cardiovascular disease is quite an encompassing um, topic, but coronary artery disease, since it's so common, um, I think that we've been watching for a while differences between men and women and not really having a lot of action on what we were seeing. So first, can you just tell me a little bit about sort of the epidemiology behind what we've seen related to cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so of course, uh, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death in women. And actually, um, uh, we're, women are no longer experiencing continued de decline in cardiovascular disease mortality. There's actually been a slight uptick in both men and women uh, since 2017 in cardiovascular disease mortality, likely due to the epidemics of obesity and diabetes. But I want to point out that the fastest growing uh, increased rates in heart disease is actually middle-aged women. And so this is an age group I think that needs particular attention. It's a time in life when a lot of women are focused on younger children or their aging parents or their careers. And it's really important that they pay attention to their heart health and know their risk factors and know the symptoms of cardiovascular disease. And do women differ from men? We've been hearing for quite some time that women are, you know, that they'll present differently, so much so that I sometimes see patients presenting the same as men, but they think their symptoms should be different. So can you touch a little bit on that? I know it sort of drives me crazy about the phrase that women have atypical symptoms. I mean, women make up half the population. I don't know how something can be atypical when it involves, you know, half the population. Um, so it is true that ischemic symptoms can present beyond chest uh, discomfort. Ischemic symptoms can present with short shortness of breath, with discomfort in the neck or the back or the jaw or the abdomen. But I think it's really important to note that um, studies have suggested in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction that women do experience chest discomfort to a similar degree as men. 90% you know, of cases of MI in women involve some chest discomfort. 
But women often more likely to report three or more additional symptoms with that, the chest discomfort. So, the, and I think sometimes these additional symptoms may distract both um, patients and clinicians away from the initial recognition of the true diagnosis. And unfortunately, a lot of times women's symptoms are dismissed. They're having real symptoms, but they're told that it's anxiety or, you know, some studies have suggested that, you know, women um, who later um, are diagnosed with myocardial infarction, you know, they were previously had symptoms. They were more likely to be told that their symptoms are from non-cardiac causes. And so as a result of this, um, both this perceived lower risk and this uh, delayed, uh, you know, recognition of symptoms, women um, often present later in their course when they have their myocardial infarction, which may contribute to the fact that women under the age of 55 who have a myocardial infarction have uh, increased risk of mortality and also are more likely to be rehospitalized. A study suggests that women are more likely to present, uh, you know, twofold more likely to present um, uh, late beyond sort of the 90 minute door to balloon time in STEMI, um, and they're more likely to not get reperfusion at all. So I think it's really important that all symptoms in women are, uh, you know, uh, considered and that really anxiety should be a diagnosis of exclusion. And certainly if you're having ischemic uh, chest pain, that can make anybody feel anxious if you're having ischemic symptoms. So um, be careful before you just attribute women's symptoms to uh, anxiety and make sure they have a proper workup. And I think that's such an important point because I think that we often feel that we're, you know, women are, the, that data is really strong showing that 90% of women have the, have chest discomfort, even if they have additional symptoms. But I feel like people aren't listening to women. Like they're, they're not seeing women as at risk, despite the fact that we've been, you know, you and I and many others have been like telling people women are more likely to die from heart disease. They're more likely to have a heart attack than these other causes, especially when they have a lot of risk factors. So I know it's a little tangential from your paper, but but how do we how do we get this message out? Because we've tried so many different ways, and we've the more recent data is showing actually, if anything, there's there's lack of awareness in in the community as well. And by the community, I mean less awareness in women of their heart risk, but also some of the work has shown that even primary care physicians and even cardiologists don't know how to risk, do a risk assessment on women. Yeah, so I was really actually someone who's been wearing my you know red dress in February and all year round, and I'm thinking you know that uh, the message is getting out there. I was really disappointed to see a recent survey uh, from the American Heart Association. This uh, paper was led by Mary Cushman, which showed that this, this is a survey that the AHA sends out frequently to, uh, to women uh, patients to ask them what they think is the leading cause of death in women. And there's actually been a decline in awareness with more uh, less women um, from previous surveys uh, indicating that heart disease was the leading cause of death in women. And this lack of awareness uh, was worse uh, among women of minority race, ethnicity uh, populations, and also among younger women who arguably might benefit the most from uh, primordial and primary prevention. So clearly, uh, you know, our current strategies are not working. Uh, I do really think it's really important that we, um, you know, empower patient advocates uh, in their own community. That um, one of my favorite studies, and this was in men, what was the, the barbershop study of uh, treating hypertension in black men when you empower barbershop owners to be able to measure blood pressure and give that information. And I think we need a similar study in, in women uh, using, you know, hair salons and spas and really leverage um, faith-based organizations. There's some wonderful work that La Princess Brewer has been doing um, uh, involving, um, involving church communities to get the message out to Black women. So we really need all hands on deck, and that includes involving uh, patient and community advocates. Um, but along this line, um, one of the things I think is really important is having specialized heart centers for women. I think I get this feedback like, well, you know, everybody takes care of women patients, you know, women make up half the population. Um, so I want to ask you, uh, Martha, you know, do we need specialized centers for women's heart? Um, obviously, I personally think we do, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. And, and can this be a way to tackle this um, disparity in terms of knowledge? Well, 
and we addressed this in one of our papers in the in this series actually about the need for women's heart centers and i you know of course you and i are both biased in this this particular aspect but I think that, you know, we've ignored women in research for so long, specifically cardiovascular research. And right now we're really fortunate. There is an emergence of a lot of data coming out, but who's staying on top of it? Probably the people that are most interested in this area, people that are focused on women. I, I think you and I might be unique in the fact that we take care of only women. I'm not sure if that's true, Erin, mm -hmm. but I, I, I haven't taken care of men for a long time. Um, except maybe on the floors when I'm on or something like that. But in my clinic practice, I only take mm -hmm. care of women and I have that ability to baby, maybe be more focused. And as the data is changing, as we are understanding more and more about women and the sex differences, I think right now we need to consider this a specialty and that we need a place where when primary care physicians may not know where, what to do or internists may not know what to do or even our cardiology colleagues, when they don't know what to do for a specific condition that's either sex specific or there's risk factors that are sex specific or sex predominant, that they have a place to go to for specialty care. And maybe this is only at tertiary centers, but it doesn't necessarily have to be because even in the community, we know this is needed. When we've been ignoring 52% of the population and calling them a special population, and, and you know, I like to think women are special, but we're not, we're not so special that we're not the majority of the population. But when we're not getting the same care and we're showing again, and I know you're gonna talk about other gaps in our care, we need to have a place. Now, maybe 20 years from now, we'll talk again and we'll say, you know, no, because we've closed these gaps and now everyone's getting trained in taking care of men and women and they know them. But right now it seems like everything in terms of our education is directed sort of universally and therefore universally has really come down to understanding men not women. And I, I think that that's, I think that's why you and I get so passionate about this topic, because one, we're seeing the emergence of new data, and we're seeing the differences. And they apply specifically to this population that we take care of. So let's go to what, you know, what your paper addressed, because in addition to obviously, we want to increase the awareness of our patients so that they can be it, they can be empowered to get the right care. But I mean, it's one thing when you, you do that and then you get to the emergency room with crushing chest pain and people tell you it's anxiety um, from the healthcare. So tell me a little bit about how, you know, what you addressed in the paper about patients presenting, you know, with cardiovascular disease. And even after, even after they present acutely, even long-term, you kind of already touched on it a little bit but the differences in care between men and women long-term and what it, what it ultimately impacts. Right, so I mentioned, um, you know, in the setting of a STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction, women actually have higher mortality. Um, and this is uh, likely due to the fact that they um, present late, um, have a longer door to balloon time, um, less likely to be revascularized. And unfortunately, there's a lot of data that suggests that women are less likely to be treated with guideline directed therapy. You know, post uh, MI, uh, one year, women are less likely to be on aspirins and statins. And it is really important to emphasize that all the available evidence indicates that women derive a similar benefit as men for secondary prevention pharmacotherapies. And this includes aspirin for secondary prevention, includes statins, includes azetamide, includes PCSK9 inhibitors, includes icosapent ethyl, includes SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. All of those have been looked at and there are no interactions by sex, meaning women at equal risk benefit just as much as, much as men. Furthermore, women are less likely to be enrolled in cardiac rehab compared to men. Um, and really to mitigate this excess risk that women have and improve outcomes, this is really dependent on identification of cardiovascular disease in women, you know, utilizing the appropriate guideline directed medical therapy, and of course, um, continuing to promote lifestyle interventions. But I will mention, you know, some of the challenges both with acutely with MI, but also um, for stable angina is that you know, women are more likely to have non-obstructive disease as men um, for uh, ischemic presentations. 
Um, and, you know, in terms of MI, which you, you brought in with the acute presentations, when women um, are presenting with acute myocardial infarction, they're almost twice as likely to present with MI with non-obstructive coronary artery disease, which we now call a minoca, which can be from several causes such as plaque erosion, a rupture, coronary embolism, thrombosis, microvascular dysfunction, or a coronary artery dissection or spasm. And as uh, uh, Dr. Noah Barry Mertz uh, often says, you know, men tend to uh, rupture, women tend to erode in terms of plaque. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important that um, women who present with Minoka get the proper workup. But there was a nice study uh, last year by Dr. Harmony Reynolds, the HARP study uh, of in Minoka, showing that a combination of using, you know, optical coherence tomography, or if that's not available in your center, perhaps you could use IVIS. Using that in combination with cardiac MRI can help elucidate the the etiology of Minoka and about 85% of women. And that's really important because treatment really depends on the cause of the um, Minoka. Um, and in, in their study, the HARP study, um, after they found the diagnosis, about 75% were due to ischemic causes and, and another 75% were due to ischemic causes and 25% were due to non-ischemic causes from an alternate diagnosis. And so really that's important because then you tailor the therapy to the underlying cause. But Erin, don't you find, I mean, you know, we we've been telling people that we need to have a diagnosis, even when they have non-obstructive disease, which, like you said, is much more commonly seen in women. But I will tell you, and even where we are aware of it and where we even are, are doing research in it in our own centers, we will still see women who do not undergo additional testing in the time of a myocardial infarction. Now, I think in our European colleagues, you know, they're at certain centers, they're doing it much more than we sort of universally are, I think, in the US. I, I don't know if you would agree with that, but I find that very frustrating because things like the functional testing in the cath lab are much less likely to occur. The things that Dr. Reynolds did in her study, which were, were so important, we don't often get that information. And then we are always um, struggling with the fact, like, should we send the patient back to the cath lab now? You know, we're seeing them four or six weeks after their myocardial infarction. We know they have no, no obstructive coronary arteries. Do you send them back to the cath lab? Do you send them for a PET or an MR? Um, and that's always the dilemma. You could have done that in the cath lab. I don't know if at Hopkins it's different. So maybe you could shed some light just in terms of your own practice. Yeah, you know, we're not really using OCT. Um, I'll talk about the management of Inoka, but also for the more stable form, um, we're often not doing provocative testing with acetylcholine in the cath lab either. That's mostly made up um, more by the diagnosis of um, non-invasive imaging tests, both functional and anatomical testing, as well as clinical symptoms. But, you know, I think it's, as I mentioned, I think there's a lot of value, particularly with Minoka and coming up with the diagnosis. I, first of all, I want to make sure that people don't miss SCAD. So spontaneous coronary artery dissection can account for up to a third of myocardial infarctions among women under the age of 50. And SCAD is treated completely differently than the, you know, ischemic causes from a, a plaque rupture because, you know, in SCAD, uh, you know, statins are not indicated for SCAD alone unless they have another etiology and there's differences in, you know, duration of, of, of antiplatelet therapy. And, and it's, you know, of course, if you're diagnosed with SCAD, you need to do the full workup to look at FMD for fibromuscular dysplasia, uh, vascular abnormalities and other beds. So it's really important that this isn't missed. And, and we really, um, if somebody has an MI uh, and not obstructive coronary artery disease, really try to get it to the, the reasons why so that the appropriate um, treatment and, uh, can be instigated. So um, I think you're talking about you know, sort of work up to go along. I've been talking about Minoka, but I just wanted to take the comment about Inoka as well, because that often kind of goes along with it. So I, uh, Minoka is myocardial infarction. So Inoka is its more stable cousin. This is ischemia with non-obstructive coronary disease. Uh, and again, um, women are actually more likely to have angina than men, but in the setting of angina, women are more likely to have non-obstructive coronary arteries. And I want to mention in the, um, the screening for the ischemia trial, so the ischemia trial, uh, was evaluating individuals with moderate to severe ischemia on a stress test. And so when working them up, determine if they were eligible to participate, 
um, they underwent a CTA, um, and 66% of, 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 of women, 66% uh, of those uh, with ischemia um, or women had actually had non-obstructive disease versus only 26% uh, uh, with obstructive disease were female. And those are the people that got into the ischemia trial. Um, so most of the women had non-obstructive disease. And it's important to note that the amount of ischemia on the stress testing wasn't actually correlated with the symptom burden of angina. You know, one might have thought that the more ischemia you have, the more angina you have, but actually that wasn't that well correlated. Um, but it's important to note that um, INOCA, ischemia with non-obstructive coronary artery disease is not benign. Um, although the prognosis is a little better than those that have obstructive disease, it's still associated with an increased five-year risk of major adverse cardiovascular events compared to women without angina, without ischemia. And it's really important that we identify non-obstructive plaque. You know, if you have a CTA, even if there's no obstruction, the presence of plaque should not be ignored in women when detected on imaging, especially women who have plaque with high-risk features that may be even a greater risk in women than in men. And to make sure that we don't miss this opportunity to implement preventative therapies for atherosclerosis, such as statins and, and ACE inhibitors and so forth. Yeah, I think those are really important uh highlights of things that I think currently aren't happening necessarily to women, but need to be happening. I think it's helpful though, certainly if we have more diagnostic tools or more diagnostic information, I guess is what I mean precisely, because if you, you know, for Anoka or Minoka, if you know it's ischemic in origin, then you will have a different you know, set of tools you might use versus like you, you highlight uh, SCAD, completely different treatment, vasospasm, different treatment. If you, if it is an MI and you ultimately diagnose Takasubos, then it's a different treatment. So I think it's, it's so complex. And hopefully now we're making our case of why you need specialists in this area, because it isn't just one disease. And I, my feeling about both Anoka and Minoka is right now we're it's a bucket. It, we're putting a lot of things into those buckets. Eventually, as we're teasing out these different uh, diagnoses, you know, you don't start, stop, sorry, you don't stop when you say Minoka, like there's other testing that needs to be done. And same for Anoka. Because right. Helping find, by making a diagnosis would be helpful to planning how you're going to treat this patient. Exactly. I was just going to say a few more things about ANOCA. You know, that can be from microvascular dysfunction um, or microvascular spasm. It's typically defined as having ischemic symptoms like chest pain, you know, the diagnosis of non obstructive coronary arteries, either by angiography or by imaging, as well as impaired flow, either through um, poor coronary flow reserve or spasm during provocative testing or decreased coronary blood flow. And so you can work this up both through an anatomical and a functional test. I kind of use both because they give you different information. You know, the anatomical tests like the CTA, you can see whether there's plaque. And if there's plaque, you can start those anti-atherosclerotic therapies like statins. But you also want to see if they have ischemia. Um, and sometimes this doesn't really show up that well on a regular stress echo. So at least at our center, some centers use stress uh, cardiac MRI. At our center, we uh, use stress PET, which I think can be really helpful in detecting microvascular dysfunction. It's very sensitive. Uh, and thus you can diagnose you know, coronary flow reserve, which is a strong indicator of prognosis. Um, and, you know, if there is a ischemia, you know, we can, um, again, medications can be tailored to the individual lying causes, uh, anti antigenal therapies to control symptoms, such as your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, nitrates, uh, renolazine um, can also help with angina in women with microvascular angina. And one thing I'll mention, unfortunately, um, stress testing, even PET, isn't very good for identifying coronary vasomotor disorders, microvascular spasm. And so guidelines have suggested that to uh, elucidate this, that it really requires invasive acetylcholine testing to test vasoreactivity, which only can be done during uh, invasive coronary angiography. And at least at our center, we are not really doing uh, an invasive um, workup for this. I don't know about your center. I know um, places like uh, Cedar sinai with Dr. Uh, Noel Berry-Mertz, so they do a lot of this, but I think it's very center dependent. 
But you know, if you have um, uh, vasospasm, this is even treated a little bit differently. You know, women with vasospastic anzina might get better benefit from calcium channel blockers or long-acting nitrates. So finding the etiology is really important. Um, and for vasospastic angina, often I'm uh, it's sort of trial and error. I take a good history and I try different things and see what helps them, uh, but making sure that their symptoms are not ignored. Yeah, I, and I think that's the, the challenge is right now it's maybe at four or five centers in the United States that routinely do provocative testing. And it's very difficult at other places to get this done. And I think our European colleagues are ahead of us in that game because they are really doing it much more frequently when you talk about our challenges and when you're talking to some of the European centers, it doesn't seem that they don't get this information. So I think, you know, we need to keep pushing um, for the for this. Now, how, what's your approach in terms of cardiac rehab? Because we know that that's a gap, obviously, for women in general. But when you have Minoka or Anoka, how, how do you use cardiac rehab in those specific cases? So I refer all uh, individuals who've had an MI, whether obstructive or not, or as, as well as individuals who have, you know, angina, um, or have had any revascularization to cardiac rehab. And, and you know, women are both under um, referred, but even when they're referred, they under enroll. And that's because there can be a lot of barriers. A lot of women have um, difficulty with access. They have often a lot of other things going on in their life. Women tend to have more of a caretaker role than men do. So um, they may have other uh, responsibilities, whether it's uh, their children or aging parents, or it, sometimes it's much harder for them to take the time off to focus on themselves. Or, and it's not necessarily um, emphasized how important it is and whether there's actually mortality benefit from a cardiac rehab, it's so underutilized. And this is why one of the things I'm excited about is trying to find options to make it more accessible. And that's one of the things that the COVID pandemic helped um, move forward because the cardiac traditional inpatient car person cardiac rehab was canceled, uh, at least during the, the early parts of the COVID pandemic. Um, there was a push, uh, like we did at our center, to develop a virtual-based cardiac rehab, uh, which can be done even using, you know, video platforms, you know, such as Zoom and, and other utilizing apps and things. To, and, you know, for most patients, um, you know, it's, it's supervised exercise done remotely can be safe. I think there was concern was the safety concerns, but with the right patient selection, I think this can be done unsafely. We need to um, develop this a bit more, but there's a lot of advantages with home-based cardiac rehab because I think it'll make much more, uh, much more accessible to all patients but particularly women. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that, that that's the one great lesson. We've learned many great lessons but during COVID, but cardiac rehab, the ability to deliver it may be a game changer, specifically for the people that aren't able to attend, which we know is a barrier. But also, maybe even in terms of affordability and, you know, different apps that we can create and that are being created may help us monitor our patients better and be able to monitor them remotely. I think for women, often they felt, um, especially some of our younger women, you know, they don't feel necessarily at home when they go to cardiac rehab, being a younger person in it. And that's often why, why they will drop out for my younger patients. They'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't, didn't really connect. Unlike our other patients who often the reason they love cardiac rehab is they connect with the community. But I find it much harder for my younger patients um, to feel why am I here or that it can um, somehow mess them mess the recovery up that they feel like I'm so young. Why am I here? Um, it's not even about the community. So I, th I think these are really exciting things for us to look at. But I think from your standpoint, you know, the way that you pointed out all these barriers, like that seem to be in the way for women. So there, there's certainly lack of awareness. They're certainly not getting to the hospital in time. Then once they get to the hospital, you mentioned the door to balloon time gets lengthen for a variety of reasons that, that have nothing to do with the patient at that point, more with our healthcare system. And then they don't get the right medications. They don't get discharged with the same therapies or even cardiac rehab. And then 
you know, they ultimately do worse. And, and this is, we're seeing women die after a myocardial infarction at rates much higher than men. And then if you're a younger woman, they're much more likely to die. So we have a lot of gaps to close, uh, I think, when we're talking about a coronary artery disease, whether it's obstructive or non-obstructive. Anything else that you wanted to touch on related to your paper or specifically this issue? I just want to emphasize again that all available evidence suggests that women benefit just as much um, from guideline directed uh, medical therapy as men do in terms of statins, PCSK9 inhibitors, zetamide, all these should be used in women. Um, but unfortunately, um, women tend to report um, more medication side effects from men, which can lead to the patients or their clinicians from stopping these important medications or decreasing doses to more tolerable side effects, so, but that leaves women vulnerable to not getting the same protection from this. And there can be biological reasons uh, about why women might have more side effects uh, due to you know, their body size, body composition, GI absorption, um, kidney excretion. Some of it may be due to um, maybe women socially, it's more acceptable to be more vocal about side effects than maybe men who feel like they can tough things out more. Um, but it's, I think it's really important that uh, we have strategies to help combat this. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies like the Samson study that suggests that the vast majority of statin associated symptoms are actually due to the nocebo effect the act of you know, taking a medication rather than what's in the medication itself. Uh, fortunately, we now have new options for secondary prevention um, for patients with statin intolerance. Uh, you know, the PCSK9 inhibitors can lower LDL by you know, uh, 50, 60%. It's been associated with reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. And we have Enclizarin on the horizon, which is a new type of PCSK9 inhibitor that uh, is, uh, inhibits a small, in, uh, small interfering RNA that blocks the synthesis of PCSK9. And this uh, only is given twice a year, you know, by subcutaneous injection, only one more shot than a flu shot. So I'm hoping that will help with adherence. Um, we also have um, an oral medication, bempedoic acid, that can reduce LDL by 18%. Um, up to 36% reduction when combined with azetamide. And methadoic acid, um, since it's a prodrug that's activated only in the liver, doesn't have the same uh, muscle side effects as statins. So I don't think now there's not excuses with getting women to LDL goal because we do have more things beyond statins, although we always should do a statin uh, rechallenge um, with education because the vast majority of patients who report intolerance to statins are able to take statins on a rechallenge. And so that's what I want to emphasize for secondary prevention, but I, I know some of the work that you've contributed to this issue was relating to primary prevention and risk factors. You know, we know that certain risk factors like diabetes and smoking um, confer a greater relative risk in women than in men, but there are unique risk factors that women experience in their lifetime that men do not experience that place them at risk. And I was hoping you can comment a little bit about those risk factors related to pregnancy. Yeah, so uh, I think that, you know, the greatest thing about the prevention guidelines that came out was highlighting these risk enhancers that many of which are actually sex specific and things that were missing actually for our assessment in women. And so our, we actually discussed a lot of the pregnancy related um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, if you will, that can occur to women that tell us that they're at high risk in the future for cardiovascular disease. The ones that I, the one that probably stands out the most is the hypertension during pregnancy, whether that's gestational hypertension, whether that's preeclampsia or eclampsia, all of those together do tend to point to women that are going to have a greater risk of heart disease, but also stroke in the next you know, short term, I think people often think that these things that occur during pregnancy are just telling us who when they're 80 years old are going to have cardiac events. I don't think that that is what we're seeing. We're seeing it within 10 years of their delivery for some of the patients. And I think that this is, you know, should be like a sign for us that these are the women we should be very proactive in terms of our primary prevention care. But that also includes not just the hypertension related uh, 
risk factors that we see or the hypertension related events that occur during pregnancy, but gestational diabetes uh, is another one, preterm delivery, and even small for gestational age, although there can be other causes why you have a, a baby that's small for gestational age, but those together seem to account for a lot of what we're seeing in younger women and that maybe at least now we're seeing an association with early or premature cardiovascular risk. And I think that traditionally we haven't really had people ask about that. We have asked about the traditional risk factors. I'm not sure always that everyone appreciated yeah. the sex differences between those risk factors, but we knew smoking, diabetes, hypertension, you know, that these were things, hyperlipidemia, that anybody could have them when they occurred, they increased the risk of cardiovascular disease. But traditionally, you know, when we do our ASCVD risk score or any other risk score, the score, those things don't come into that, that equation at all. And by using these risk enhancers, we can identify women that maybe you upgrade them, or maybe you, you do additional testing to find are they at a greater risk of heart disease and be able to do, you know, whether that's a coronary calcium score or something that will help you further restratify these women. At the same time, I, I will be in complete agreement with people do, we don't have many trials. There's some small trials now coming out about how, you know, addressing some of these risk factors early and, and do we at least lower the risk for hypertension in the future or lower the risk for diabetes when we're talking about gestational diabetes. But in terms of hard cardiovascular outcomes, we don't have that data yet, but I do think that that's what we need. But in the meantime, it doesn't mean we should wait. If we see these women, whether it's us, whether it's internists, whether it's family physicians, if you're taking care of these women, that should be routinely part of your risk assessment to identify these women and be able to provide more intensive care. I think when women deliver, there's, there's a couple things that go on actually at, during delivery. Of course, they deliver the baby. So that's exciting and hopefully beautiful and, and, and you know, um, something to be happy about. But a lot of these issues go away. You know, hypertension, if they have gestational hypertension or even preeclampsia, you know, it goes away after they deliver the baby. For most people, they don't go home with antihypertensive medication, or if they do within a first week of delivering, they're often off those medications. Same with gestational diabetes, it goes away. The other things, you know, they're, they're just things that you remember about your pregnancy, if you had a preterm birth or small for gestational age, but you don't, you, they're, they're not really something that a woman necessarily is going to hang on to because as, it's the health of the child at this point that they're concentrating on. The problem is, is that we're not getting always that information. And we see this as a barrier across the world. It's, you know, whether you use electronic health records, whether you use paper records, it doesn't matter. People are not getting this information. You don't ask the woman what happened. You're not going to know. And women remember everything about their pregnancy. They can tell you the, the, to the exact kilogram of the weight of their baby. They can tell you the exact you know, date, like how many weeks they were pregnant for and the number of days that, you know, they delivered early or late. Everyone remembers that. And we, we, we need to get that information. And of course, in electronic health records, I think it could be better embedded as part of um, their medical history. And hopefully one day, some of these electronic health records, people will listen to us about that needing to be in there. But in the meantime, we need to be asking our women about these things that occurred during pregnancy and then addressing it. Maybe not addressing it right after they deliver a baby because their focus is on the baby. But you know, we talk about this fourth trimester and that's the, the title of our paper is that you know, really the fourth trimester doesn't have to really even be equivalent to the trimesters of the, the three months uh, of of being pregnant each, each three month period, but rather the point after you deliver the child, what do we need to focus on? I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear, at least as cardiologists, to know that less than half of women actually show up for their, their postpartum visit. We lose a lot of women there. They, they don't show up. And there's a lot of reasons for that, at least in the US, the lack of um, 
uh, maternity leave is a huge barrier for women to actually make those appointments, but also women, if they feel fine, they think they don't need it. And, you know, if they're already back at work, it's an inconvenience. And that six week mark has actually really been an indis, it, there's no reason for it. It was just sort of something that many years ago that the obstetricians decided, well, we'll just have the six week postpartum visit. Now, some people need it at that point, but we need to think about this as a longer period of what should we address in that visit? Certainly acutely, if there's acute issues, address them, but start talking to them. Listen, during your pregnancy, this happened. This is why I'm referring you to a preventive cardiologist for more intensive uh, you know, assessment of your risk and tell us what we need to do for your future. But I do think they're making opportunities, even when we make these diagnoses of preeclampsia and informing them why it might be important for the future. That's what women need. If they understand that this is going to affect them in the short term, believe me, they care. Because as you already talked about, Women are the caregivers pr predominantly in their families and they want to be there for those children. So if you make a point that, you know, in the next 10 years, something could happen, you know, they're, they understand they're still young women. You're young when you deliver babies, you're, you're still young 10 years later, in my opinion. So I, I think we really need to put it in a perspective that they would understand and help engage in their care. And I, again, you talked about the COVID benefits, like the, the telehealth part of, of care. You know, we should be able to make these visits as convenient for young women to help them understand, to talk about it, and then maybe decide, do we need an in-person visit or not? But that at least could be a way for us to reduce the barrier in their care, because I think that that, I, I, I know you and I both see a lot of postpartum women, and I don't know if your clinic's like mine, but I actually have, we, we joke in our clinic that we have a 50% no-show rate. And, you know, we, 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 because they're young, well, whenever we see the young age, we're like, yeah, they might not show up. And 50% of the time, I'll tell you, they don't show up. But, but during COVID, they were more likely to show up because it was by telehealth. Right. No, I, I agree completely. As a cardiologist, you know, uh, uh, only a select number of women actually make it to my clinic. And this is why we really need to engage um, OBGYN, primary care providers, all hands on deck. And I've said a lot, like, I think it'd be a great idea because uh, mothers will, new mothers will take their babies to the pediatrician visit. So I always argue, check the mother's blood pressure at the baby's pediatrician visit, because, uh, you know, that's a, a time when the mother is there with the baby and the mother may not go get her own blood pressure checked at her own visit, but she, she'll take the baby to the, the, the pediatrician visit. So check the mother's blood pressure as well. Um, so, you know, cardiobstetrics is a, a topic near and dear to my heart from both the clinical and research perspective. So I encourage everybody to read this wonderful review on the fourth trimester that Martha wrote with uh, our colleagues, uh, Pense Wu and, and Key Park. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to mention that we've been talking about adverse pregnancy outcomes, but that there is a number of female specific factors, such as early menarche, um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, infertility, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, early menopause. And, you know, we need to take, all clinicians need to take a comprehensive reproductive history on all women, even if we think they're out of childbearing uh, ages, because this will identify these red flags of risk, including these adverse pregnancy outcomes that might identify women who might benefit from more intensive uh, primer prevention. So it's really important that we ask women and, and, and I encourage to have it built into your, you know, clinic templates that you uh, fill in for all your new patient visits to take a, a reproductive history in, in, all, uh, in all your women patients. So thank you for featuring this topic in this special issue. Yeah, no, well, I think we've kind of used up a lot of our time here. So uh, I guess we, as everyone predicted, we could talk about this for hours because I still have so many things I wanted to ask you about, but I guess we'll save that if they invite us back for another podcast. So uh, again, thank you, Dr. Mikos, for being here today and for writing such a great paper for us with your team and also leading in this space uh, 
both nationally and internationally. That's one of the main reasons we chose to have you here today. Um, and again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Angela Moss, my co-editor of this special series all about women and sex differences and cardiovascular disease that you can read uh, the European Cardiology Review. Um, and thanks Radcliffe for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you.